Now I would like to welcome Reverend Erin McCabe. She is the senior minister of Unity Viz Village Chapel and she's joining us today from Unity Village. She is a singer songwriter with multiple albums and lives with a passion for environmental stewardship. She is the founder and director of Campaign for Consciousness, annually uniting a virtual global community in conscious intention for global transformation. Erin is the advising minister for the Light Center and Love Light, a unity retreat center and permaculture-based farm with volunteer outreach programs in South Africa, serving grandmothers and youth orphaned by the AIDS pandemic. Also, Erin serves as an advisor on the Association of Global New Thought Leadership Council, led by Reverend Dr. Michael Beckwith. Please give a warm welcome to Reverend Erin McCabe. Hello, everyone. It is a delight to be back with you again. Thank you for having me. I am grateful to be here, grateful to be in Kansas City while we're just south of Kansas City, southeast of Kansas City. Um, so I am at Unity Village, but I'm grateful to be both in Unity Village and in Canada this morning. So it is a delight and an honor to gather with you on this morning. And last time I joined you was about a month ago. It was April. And uh, we talked about April showers bring May flowers. If you know that saying, in with the lion, out with the lamb. And we're talking about the concept that there are um, things in our lives that are unsettling, that feel chaotic, that feel intense, that feel heavy, things in the world around us that feel that same way. And what do we do? How do we presence those things spiritually so that we have a spiritual practice around our lives so that we are not thrown back and forth by the world and we don't let ourselves start and stop life and follow a path based on the immediate feedback of the world, but we go to spirit, we go to source. Now, I shared last time a couple of quotes from one of my favorite uh, authors of this time. His name is Michael Singer, and he's written a couple books, including The Untethered Soul and Living Untethered. And he said, what is in front of you is a very holy thing, all of it. So it's like when our minds are saying what is in front of us is not a holy thing, can we hold that as an affirmation of truth? What is in front of us is a holy thing, all of it. He also said every single moment in front of you took billions of years with everything happening exactly like it did to manifest as it is. Think of something in your life that goes along with the April showers. Now, if you love rain, that's not going to fit. But along with the storms in your life, along with the chaos in the world around us, right? We can look at anything that's going on and we could say, oh, okay, even this moment, even this took billions of years to form. Now, the song, you, you all have an amazing music um, minister that is uh, giving you incredible music. I've noticed that. I mean, it's, it's right on um, for the last time that I was here and this time. But the music today was so right on. You're, the first song was about the storms. It was about saying hallelujah anyway. There are storms, relentless. Sometimes we feel like we're in an unending battle. Um, sometimes we're in between in life. We're in all of the questions. Um, sometimes we have nothing left to give. And he said that becomes the sweetest offering. So think about that in our lives. Um, and then he says, just to sing, sing hallelujah anyway. That's what Michael Singer is talking about. He's talking about like in the midst of what the human condition feels like and how the human condition and how the world around you and the world within you sometimes, the emotional world, judges what, what is in front of us. Can we have a practice? Can we have that affirmation? Can we have the unity way, the spiritual path? Um, he also said, Michael Singer said, there are no problems. There are just learning experiences. No matter what happens, you are becoming greater. You are becoming greater no matter what happens. The second song that you all had for today's service that we had to experience together is um, about imagine being on top of the world, right? Like imagine those May flowers. Imagine, even though in with the lion, out with the lamb, imagine the time and the space of peace and presence when we, we, just, we just see the fruits of our labor, we see the fruits of our practice, we see peace and we experience peace. Um, it talked about in that song, cutting corners, oh, cutting corners. 
that sometimes we want to go from that one song, the hallelujah anyway, we want to go from, you know, this is how it looks into the beautiful world. We want to go straight from April and we want to skip all the rain showers, right? We want to just hop right to the flowers. Like, give me the flowers. Like, let me just pull them out of the seeds. Like, let me go to those seeds and just dig them up and start just dragging out those flowers because I need the flowers. I need the flowers to be happy. I need the flowers to think my world is okay. I need the flowers to give me affirmation and confirmation that I'm on the right path, that I'm on the right track, that I'm doing the right things, that my life isn't a mess or the world isn't a mess. I need that confirmation. But the confirmation doesn't come from the world around us, does it? I think we've all had that experience a lot of times. Um, we also last time talked about this idea about peace versus happiness from Eckhart Tolle, where he said, is there a difference between happiness and inner peace? He says, yes, happiness depends on conditions being perceived as positive. Conditions, outer conditions, the outer results being perceived as positive. But he says that peace does not, inner peace does not depend on that. And I want to share a new quote today from Ralph Waldo Emerson. He said, the purpose of life is not to be happy. I mean, think about that. The purpose of life is not to be happy. He says it is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. So that's a different practice. That's a different practice than looking at the world around us going, I need it all to be perfect right now. I need all of the flowers. I need everything to look the way I want it to look or my mind wants it to look. So about a year ago, right now, I can't even believe this. It's a year ago, like exactly right now. Um, about a year ago, it was our 100 year anniversary at Unity Village Chapel, 100 year anniversary of the ministry. And it was just over my 10 year anniversary. So they kind of lined up. I'm a little bit ahead of the 100 year. And that's pretty significant. You know, that's significant for Unity village that's significant for this spiritual community. It was significant for me 10 years. And we're coming off a pandemic and there are a lot of changes happening at the village. And we went to a meeting and, you know, we're, we're moving along. We know that there are shifts happening at the village and we may be moving sanctuaries. We may, we may be adjusting things because everything, you know, given COVID, given life, given resources, everything is just up in flux. And everyone's looking at how do we do things differently now? What do we do now? And moving forward, we've got to stop thinking about what we've done in the past, and we need to make positive movements forward and create new visions. So that was happening at Unity World Headquarters, creating new visions and happening at Unity Village Chapel. But one of the things that happened was in May, when it was the time for our um, 100 year, and we're talking about how do we acknowledge this and celebrate this. And um, we came into these meetings, and they were just before May. But anyway, we came into these meetings and got the, you know, the final word on when our move was going to happen and when these rearrangements were going to happen about where we're going to be, what sanctuary we're going to be in. You know, we'd been in the sanctuary that we were in for, I don't know, since the 80s. And we'd been in the area we were in for a long time. And so we got word that there were a lot of shifts happening. And so all of a sudden, when my body and my brain feels like we should be at this climax, you know, I've been here for 10 years. What's the impact? How are we doing? Um, we've been here for 100 years. How does it feel? All of a sudden at that moment, it was like April showers came down. It felt like everything was just being dismantled and falling apart. And uh, we were going to need to move sanctuaries. We we're going to need to move quickly. And, you know, we had about a, a month to get everything you know, packed up and rearranged. And, you know, uh, the congregation was in a different place in flux. The volunteers were in different places because of everything that had been going on. And it was just very challenging to look at everything that was happening and go, this is great. This is in order. Everything's in order. And um, everything's right on track. And <sighs> there are going to be flowers. It was really hard to stand in that moment. I'm here a year later. I'm here a year later. And the difference in what's going on, the difference in where we are, how it feels to be in our new sanctuary, how it feels to be in our new offices with the gorgeous new labyrinth right outside of the window, how it feels to have a new staff, because that's the other thing we had going on is the whole staff was dismantling. And I felt like I was sitting there alone, like here I am holding this ship and I'm trying to hold everything together. Where in your life 
do you feel like you're having to hold everything together? Where in your life do you feel like I should be here? We should be there. This is what should be happening. Maybe it's your bank account. Maybe it's your relationships. Maybe it's the world around you. Maybe it's something about the world within you. But I should be here and I'm not here. I'm still in April showers. What do we do in those times? What I did then was, you know, hold on to the practice and try to keep putting one foot in front of the other, kind of like the daily word said today, you know, the daily word talked about, you know, comfort and, 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 and even being triggered by maybe something happened this time last year. I'm even going through that right now. I can feel my body's response to this month and this time period of going, okay, is this a little PTSD going on? But what do we do with the practice when we're feeling this? When we as a community went through this time last year, it was clear that we are not going to be doing a hundred year anniversary celebration. We're not going to be doing a lot of the other things we're going to need to do. We needed to hone in and we need to figure out how we're going to navigate this change, even um, emotionally among the community. And as we're figuring that out, I thought there's no way we can do this hundred year anniversary celebration. So we dropped it and it's been dropped and dropped and dropped and we're a year later. And we almost didn't pick it back up. And then I thought, we still need to do this. We still need to acknowledge it. Well, it's so silly. It was really last year and now it's this year. Well, now it's really not 10 year of an anniversary for me, it's 12 years. Um, How are we gonna do this? But when we apply the spiritual practice and we look at what is the purpose of something and we get grounded, we get anchored, we realize it is important to have a spiritual practice where we acknowledge milestones, where we acknowledge what we're called to acknowledge. And I knew that was a calling, right? To acknowledge this milestone. So can we say to ourselves, can we step into a place where even though it doesn't feel like everything's aligning, we can know we have a vision and we can know that in due time, if we wait upon the spirit, it will be time. There will be a time for something to come. In Psalms 37, seven through 20, it says, be patient. That was seven through nine. It says, be patient and wait upon the Lord to act. Don't be worried about those who prosper or those who succeed in their plans. Don't give worry. Don't give away, give in to worry or anger. It only leads to trouble. Those who trust in the Lord, the spirit, the law will possess the land but those in error will be driven out. So can we take that passage and can we recognize that that has wisdom for us, that there is a time for everything? And can we be willing to just take the next step and continue listening? What happens is that when we don't do that, we miss stuff. We miss stuff and we miss it for good. We sell ourselves short. We even leave things before it's time to leave, or we push through with things that we should be giving time, that in due time, things will be revealed about it. So can we trust the next step? Can we have visions, but not have visions that we are so intent on having them come into fruition right now that we have the ability to give them space to blossom, to acknowledge that the rain and the storms and the chaos are part of the creative process. That in fact, they evolve into and lead to what is coming and we can stand in each moment knowing that that's true. Last time we gathered together, we talked about kind of the practice and the bad things and the idea that we have the practice so that bad things won't happen or so that we won't have discomfort, or so that there won't be showers. Can we give that up once and for all? Can we recognize that everything is moving and working together for good? Can we stop trying to cut the corners um, in our practice, in being in the present moment, in allowing ourselves to move forward one step at a time without trying to eat the whole meal and call it good. Where in your life are you pushing something? And 
then actually by the process of rushing it, pushing it, might you be destroying it? Might you be standing not in faith, but in fear, not in spirit, but in ego, not in God, but in the world and the timeline of the world? And can we dive into the spiritual practice instead? Can we just pause and create some space and hop into the spiritual practice? And can we ask ourselves, really truly ask ourselves, where am I being called into patience? Where am I being called into patience? And what activities in my life develop patience? You know, I have a lot of girlfriends and a funny theme with my girlfriends is that a lot of them are puzzle people. They like puzzles. They do puzzles. And I had a girlfriend with me recently and we were doing a puzzle with my daughter. And I just all of a sudden saw all of these strong women in my life and realized how much they all like puzzles. And I said to her, I said, that's an interesting thing. I wonder what it is about me and what attracts me to you puzzle women, women that like puzzles. And she just looked down and looked up with her quiet hands. We actually had three puzzles going, a little one for her, a little one for my daughter and a little one for me. And she was just diligently working on hers. And she said, well, it takes a lot of patience to work on a puzzle. And I thought, yeah, it does. And I often in my life and in my being feel a lot of impatience. And I can recognize the places in my life where I have impatience and it moves me out of the flow of life. And she said, you also have to have, you know, a lot of quiet inside, like a lot of stillness, a lot of peace inside. So how can we take that and apply that to the practice? How can we recognize that some things in the practice take patience and take spaciousness? You know, when you work on a puzzle, people that do it, they all have their own strategy, right? What's your puzzle strategy if you're a puzzle doer? Some people go for all the edges first, right? Some people go for the middle design or the structures in it, right? They look for the tree or the person or the animal or the building. Some people do colors and separate them into colors. But there is a process to it, right? And if you went into a puzzle without honoring the process, imagine trying to solve it without honoring the process. So too is life and so too is the spiritual practice. There is a process to life, a process to honoring the practice. And it takes patience. So the contemplative question for the day is really where am I being called into patience and what activities develop it within me? Where in my life might I be digging up seeds that are planted in April that need the rain showers, that need the sunshine, that need the right environment, that need cultivation before flowering? What are the nutrients in my life that are like the sunshine, like the fresh air, like the conditions to support my spiritual development, to support my practice? Can we think about that? Do we spend time in contemplative meditation? Do we spend time gaining and developing and nourishing the support that we as unique, unrepeatable patterns of God expressing know, ground us and anchor us no matter what kind of storms are outside so that we can remember that in the midst of everything, April showers bring May flowers. Myrtle Fillmore, so many years ago, received a vision of her healing, received a knowing of her healing, received an assurance that her physical body could be healed from what she was going through. She had years of um, increasing deterioration. And then she got it that she is a child of God and she does not inherit anything but wholeness, right? She does not inherit anything but peace, that God is peace, God is love, God is wholeness. And she got that at such a deep level, she knew it. 
But here's the part of that story that's not always shared. It wasn't in that instant that all of the physical effects of that healing revealed themselves. It wasn't immediate. She didn't all of a sudden fail to have all the symptoms that she was having before her healing. It took a year plus. It took walking that year in faith, the perceiving power of mind, Charles Fulmer said, linked with the ability to shape substance. It took a year of walking in and with that knowing and with the symptoms and with the outer conditions, not affirming her for the results to be made manifest, for the fruits of her knowing and her wisdom and her labor to reveal themselves. Charles Filmer had the same kind of thing. He had a, a leg that was shorter than the other and, and he did some of this work and, and he just held to it growing. And it's not like he woke up the next morning with a longer leg. He, he unfolded the journey. He walked the walk. He engaged in the process. So can we create conditions in our lives that support the unfoldment of the Mayflower and just stick to the practice, recognize that moment by moment, moment by moment, we are called into patience. Eric Butterworth in the book, Life is for Living, said this, the teachings of unity seek to challenge you and rightly so, to come up higher, to press on to the goal of your own divine perfection. You should make every attempt to meet your needs on the highest level possible and to put away childish things. He goes on to say, you should not make the mistake, however, of trying to make a child into an adult overnight. Take one step at a time in patience. And even if you cannot get up and walk immediately, you can keep your eyes on the goal while crawling forward. So we breathe into that practice. Keep our eyes on the goal while crawling forward. April showers bring May flowers. I step out of the idea of judging the outer conditions and I live from the inside out, from my source to my world. Namaste. Friends, let's take some time for meditation. I know this is unconventional, but you are at Unity Village with me and I want you to feel that this morning. So I'm gonna take you on a little walk and someone let me know if for some reason it's not working with the live stream or it comes off, but I wanna take you out to the fountain at Unity. We're gonna have to walk through my congregation here because they're getting ready for service that starts just a little bit here. But we're going to do our meditation. So I invite you to just become comfortable where you are. Just start to quiet down your part in your body. As we move into this space, that I'm saying to you, I just want to bring you to the heart of the village, your village, your space, your environment. Where are your fountain? Here are beautiful little ones. So I invite you to take a few deep breaths. Hello, beautiful. Hello. I invite you to take a few deep breaths right where you are. Inhaling and exhaling into this moment. Just feel the gorgeous energy of the village. You might want to keep your eyes open for today's meditation. You might want to close them. But just inhale and exhale right where you are. Feel the energy of the village, the energy of patience unfolding as this property and grounds. Charles and Myrtle got a vision, and it was one dream at a time, one step at a time, one moment at a time. It was not an easy route where everything just lined up every second on the outside 
it was a simple route where they went to source for everything. There is the bridge of faith, the perceiving power of mind linked with the ability to shape substance. Here you are in the midst of your spiritual practice, inhaling and exhaling, knowing what faith and what patience can create. So we give ourselves the space and the time to feel the practice. to birth something beautiful. We look at the roses, we look at flowers, and we know they don't grow by digging up the soil. They don't grow by taking them out of the sun and pressuring them, forcing them. They grow through patience. Sticking with the season, knowing when it's the right time and trusting that, getting it from source, not from the world around you, from source. So let's move into a time of silence. Never. In the moment, I right in the Acknowledging this holy moment, this divine appointment. Breathing into the space. Coming home to the inner temple. Coming home to the place of our contentment. Place where we trust, we know that we know that all is well that we're doing everything we're called to do in each moment, stepping forward, moment by moment, in this thing we called life. So let's breathe together into a moment of silence. Just grateful. Grateful for the practice, grateful for this community. Grateful for the flowers in the village. Grateful for the showers. Inhaling and exhaling into the silence. Inhaling and exhaling, allowing the breath to take us deeper into this moment, deeper into a moment of faith and trust. Just allowing the spiritual process within to reveal and to unfold, to lift, to transform. By the power of this practice, may all beings have freedom from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings know God as love and themselves as emanations of this love. May all beings know that we're born blessed and here to be a blessing. 
in honor of the lives we've been given and the time and the form we give this life. Namaste. Thank you, Aaron. Wow. I really like what you said that there are no problems. Through faith and patience, we can see they are truly opportunities. Thank you for your words of wisdom. You are an example of a spring flower in full bloom. We love spending our time with you. We love having you with us, and we look forward to listening to your wisdom again. Thank you so much. What a gift to be with you all today. Blessings. You're welcome. <laughs>